goodness I would be desperate without your love sleep to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross you have won me with your Chase me down when I was lost. Where would I be if it wasn't for the cross? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now Thank you, Jesus, I was a 
today about the old self and the new self, darkness and light. So last week, we went over Paul's exhortation to build each other up, to build each other's faith up and receive from and also participate in the teaching gifts that Christ has given to the church. We are to build each other up until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what we're supposed to be building each other up into. We're not supposed to be building ourselves up into some sort of uh, online church uh, phenomenon. We're not supposed to be building ourselves up to be the biggest church in our community. We're not supposed to build ourselves up so that we can be boastful or prideful or build ourselves up only in self, um, self uh, improvement. We're supposed to build ourselves up until we reach the full measure of the stature of Christ. That's what we're here to do. That's how we're building each other up. And so this week, we're going to be going on from that point that Paul made, and we're going to talk about the Word of God that was delivered by him in Ephesians chapter 4, 17 through 24, and also we're going to be adding in a few various scriptures from the Apostle John. So, the growth that we experience in Christ Jesus, this growth that we experience within the church as we operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the teaching gifts, these gifts that build us up, the growth that we're supposed to experience is both a mental grasp We can grasp and comprehend it and understand it. We have a good working knowledge of it. We can apply it. But also it's more than that. It's a spiritual reality. It is something that is a reality in our life. It is something to be known, but it is also something to become. So we're going to start off with know and do the Word of God. And I want to first talk about two scriptures before we get to our main text. The first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, there's two things that pop out in this scripture to me. It, as we present ourselves, we are workers. There's no... There's no consumers. There's no audience in the church. We are workers and co-laborers with Jesus Christ. So we need to be working. Now, we do that in several places. First of all, you need to be working in your families. You're a worker for Christ. What does Christ want to accomplish in your family? You are all workers in your families. What is it that Christ wants to accomplish with your friends? You are workers with Christ to accomplish what he wants to happen with your friends. Your neighbors, what does God want to happen in your neighborhood? That is what God wants you to be a part of as a worker with him. And then also a worker within the church. Now, a lot of what we can do for the family, what we can do for our friends and community has a lot to do with the way the church is unified and working together as co-laborers with Christ. So we are workers. But then, not just workers who get busy doing things, but workers who rightly handle the word of truth. A lot of times when people are involved in what we call the social gospel, where they feed people, they uh, bring medication to people, but they never mention God, that social gospel a lot of times what happens is is that they will compromise 
what they know is the word of truth in order to have access to help people. What we need to do is rightly handle it. You don't need to be offensive with the word of God. You need to be, you need to be happy about the word of God. You need to be joyful about the word of God and share it in a joyful way. And then that way you can rightly handle the word of truth. Of course, you need to know the word. You need to properly understand it. But also you need to handle it in the right way. So these are, this is a scripture that tells us about knowing the word of God. And also, uh, we find that when we know the word of God, we're supposed to become something that bears fruit. We are supposed to be something where the truth of God comes out in our life naturally. So we are also to become one with Christ. And then his truth will spring forth from our inner being. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, Colossians 3, 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. So we're supposed to be filled richly. You know, God's not skimping on what he's poured out to us with grace and mercy. What God has poured out to us in his truth and revelation, God has not it's been stingy, so let's not be stingy with what we put inside our hearts and what we become. Let the Word of God be rich inside of our hearts. But also, we're supposed to teach each other wisdom, not just knowledge, wisdom. How do you use this knowledge? And then singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So very briefly, I just want to tell you what those are. So a, a psalm is a sacred song or poem. This is something that's full of, of God's word. This is something full of God's power. Uh, this is something like you pull out of the Psalms and scripture and other prayers or poems and, and other uh, literature that we find within the scriptures that are, that are praises of God, full of the richness of the truth. Now that's a, that's a psalm. But then also we have hymns. The word hem means praise. In fact, in the Old Testament, in several places in the Psalms, the word, the, the proper way to interpret what they're saying is, I will hem you. I will praise you. We read in our English version of the Bible, but it is actually, I will hem you. So therefore, we are sharing praises of God. And then a spiritual song is spontaneous. Spontaneous worship of God. So that brings us to our text today. Now that we know that we're supposed to know uh, the Word of God and rightly handle it, but also we're supposed to become what the Word of God is giving to us, we are going to move now into Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 24. I'm going to read the entire section to you, and then I'm going to return back and go through this in two sections. So Ephesians 4, verse 17 through 24. It says, now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to, the, to sensuality Greed and greedy practice, um, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned. That is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Christ. The truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, the true right, in true righteousness and holiness. Or Amen. Those that do not walk with God have done six things, and continue on doing six things, that drive them deeper into a state that is hard to return from. So before I get to those, I want to talk to you about light and darkness. 
so that we can understand these scriptures more deeply. So John chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 says this, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it or comprehended it. Comprehend it means you can wrap your mind around something. You can consume it. You are bigger than the, the, what um, you are, you are uh, comprehending. You are bigger than what you overcome. Of course, the light of God was not overcome by the darkness of men, the darkness of humankind. It was not, it, they could not even comprehend it. Darkness cannot dispel light. Light, when it enters a room, dispels darkness. And darkness never overcomes it. And so, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, uh, 4, chapter 4, verse 17 through 19, I want to talk about six things that those who are in darkness do. So, verse 17 begins, Now this I say and testify in the Lord. In fact, he's, he's saying, listen to what I'm saying. I'm telling you the truth that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. You see, the futility of their minds. I'm telling you what, people who are in darkness are not stupid. People who do not follow Jesus Christ are not stupid. People who are refusing to bend to the truth of God's word are not stupid. It's just that the way of their thinking is futile. It doesn't produce the truth. It produces something else. Instead of producing the light, it produces the darkness. And as they continue on in this darkness, it, they're just compounding it. Could you imagine being in a completely dark room? And in that room are all kinds of objects. There could be lamps and tables and there could be chairs and things that we're very familiar with because we have seen and used them in the light. But there could be other things in there that we've never encountered. I used to be a youth pastor, and one of the things I did was I would have the youth reach into several bags that they couldn't see into, and they'd have to feel what's in there and tell me what it was. I would pick things that they'd never touched with their hands or seen in the light. On one occasion, I put a beef tongue inside one of those bags. You should have seen the reactions of those kids and the things that they were guessing it was. They thought it was a snake. They thought it was something dead. They, they could, well, it was dead, wasn't it? But they, they came up with all kinds of guesses and they never could figure out what it was. Of course, when I took it out of the bag, they really freaked out because they would never had experienced it in the light. They couldn't tell what it was. When you are in the futility of your mind in darkness, you are guessing at what something is because you have no truthful experience with it. And sometimes when we're sharing the truth of Scripture with someone, when we're sharing with them the truth of goodness that comes from God in comparison to what they may have just done, sometimes when mothers are raising their kids, the children have not seen and experienced this truth for themselves, and therefore they can't comprehend it. Only God can help a person comprehend this truth. Only God can bring light into this situation. So in verse 18, it says, they are darkened in their understanding. They are darkened in their understanding. It is incomplete. They, ha they have no opportunity to get all the evidence they need in order to understand it. And then it continues in verse 18, alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them. Listen, you can't blame them for being ignorant of what they cannot fully understand because they don't have all the evidence. But here is where it begins to show where they are at fault. We don't have to remain ignorant. We don't have to remain someone who is in the darkness in our understanding. We can get all the evidence that is needed to comprehend the truth. But we have to do this. We have to open up our hearts. In verse, the end of verse 18, it says, due to the hardness of their heart. See, a lot of times people don't want to admit they're wrong and they harden their hearts to the truth. A lot of times people don't want to stop a particular lifestyle. So therefore, they harden their heart to the truth. And when you harden your heart, you remain in the darkness. And the light of God 
does not illuminate you. It continues in verse 19. It says, they have become callous. See, the Holy Spirit reaches out to every single human being. Every man, woman, and child has the Holy Spirit reaching out to them right now. The Holy Spirit convicts us or, or, or wants us to take a stand on what is right, what is wrong, and it also lets us know, the Holy Spirit lets us know, that we will be judged according to what we do with that knowledge of what is right and wrong. Every single human being, Christian, non-Christian, has the Holy Spirit of God acting on their heart in that way. But because these people have hardened their hearts, and because they have over and over and over again resisted God, they have become calloused. Their hearts are callous. You know, when you get calloused hands or calloused fingers, you can't feel things as much. You can't, you're not sensitive to what you're touching. And the same thing goes for the calloused heart. You're not sensitive to the things of God. And then it continues on in verse 19. Having given themselves. So this is where they're making a choice again. They have given themselves up to sensuality. Let's stop there. What is this sensuality? A lot of times we jump right to sex. Well, of course, sex is, in, there is, is sensuality to, um, to engage in sex. And not all sex is wrong. Sex within marriage is proper and right. But sensuality is the senses. It is, it is a desire for pleasure in your senses. What you see, what you eat, what you feel, what you touch, what you're experiencing. It is an addiction. Sensuality is an addiction to having pleasurable experience over and over and over again. The thing is about our experiences like this, the more experiences you have, the more immune you have to this drug that you're addicted to. The more experiences of sensuality that you have, it could be being addicted to different kinds of foods. It could be addicted to different kinds of, of entertainment like TV or, or your iPad, addicted to your iPhone, addicted to Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is. It's your addiction to sensuality, your addiction to this experience. And you could be sensual as far as being outside the realm of God's will with with your sexuality. So sensuality is something that I think almost all Americans battle with. And because we harden our hearts, because our hearts have become callous to the Holy Spirit, we give ourselves over to these things. We're addicted to sensuality. And then after we're addicted to sensuality, then we become greedy. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The more you're addicted to a drug, the more you become used to it, the more tolerant, and the more you seek after that drug or a stronger drug. The more you're addicted to alcohol, the more you become uh, used to it, the more you, you're, uh, you become somebody who needs more to get the same effect, and you move from one alcohol to a stronger alcohol until you get from it what you want. And that's what this giving over to the practice of every kind of impurity is this going through door after door, deeper and deeper into a situation where you are further and further away from God, further and further into the darkness, further and further someone who is difficult to reach with the truth. So, this is not what God has designed for you to be. This is not His will for our lives. It's not the will of God for anyone to understand how terrible our actions are and how good our actions can be. We need to move from the diminished ability of understanding within the darkness to the enhanced ability to understand that we find within the light. We've got to turn the lights on. 
when you walk into a strange place, you walk into a strange environment, you don't want to just go around on your hands and knees groping and feeling things in order to try to figure out what it is. You could get injured. You could encounter something dangerous. You could encounter something. uh, You could misunderstand something and put yourself in peril. But when you turn on the light switch and you see the whole room, you can easily walk through and navigate that room. You can easily navigate your life when the light is turned on. We need to understand that when we're left in the darkness, we have great potential to do greatly evil things. We have, when we turn on the lights, the potential to do great good. Let's look at Psalms 56, verse 13, when it talks about this darkness and light and the moving from one to the other. It says, For you have delivered my soul from death. Now that is a strong word. That word death means separation, but we use it most of the time when we're separating ourselves, when we're being separated from the living. You have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of his life. John 8, verse 12 says this, Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Not separation from the living, but union with the living. Not separation from God, but union with God. We'll have that light. So those who walk with Christ practice three important steps and then continue to take those steps for the rest of their lives. We find these in in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. It says, but this is not the way you learned Christ. I'm telling you what, if you ever attended a church, If you ever attended a youth ministry, if you ever attended a children's church that taught you to be in darkness, that taught you to harden your heart, that taught you to be calloused to the things of God and taught you to be sensual and taught you to give yourself over to every impure thing, then you needed a new church. But I don't really know personally of a church that does that. So you were taught Christ in some way. In this church, in another church, when you were growing up, I remember I wasn't even a believer and I was being taught Christ properly in a church that wasn't all that great, but at least what they were teaching me was true. The little that I learned was true. Later on, when I decided to seek out God and to seek out Christ and to give my life to Him, those lessons came back to me. In fact, it it wasn't just that they came back to me. They became a part of me as I was being raised. Even though I had done great uh, great evil, I had done some bad things in my life, I was also oftentimes a good boy, a good man. And so I needed to do something, and I could only do it when I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. Only when I was born again, and only when the Spirit of God was in my life, only when I began to read the Word of God, Only then could I begin to do step one that we find. uh, Well, first here, I want to do verse 21. It says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, verse 22 says, this is the first step that followers of Christ do. They put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So the first step, The first step in getting out of the darkness and into the light, the first, uh, the step that you continue to do to remain in the light is to put off your old self. Every time you encounter your old self, take it off. It's kind of like your walk with Christ is that you're you're, uh, a hiker going through the woods and, and you finally get tired of smelling your sweaty old hat, so you take it off. And you put on a new hat that doesn't smell so stinky. But then pretty soon you start to get tired of the stinky t-shirt you're wearing. So you stop and you put on a new t-shirt. And then you're not so stinky. But then eventually 
Man, your pants begin to stink, and you just say, you know what, I need to put on a new pair of pants. So as you're going through your walk as a Christian, you're discovering what needs to be put off so that you can put on the new in Christ Jesus. We put off the old stuff that was anchored in corrupt corruption. It was anchored into deceitful desires. We put those off. The second thing that someone does as they leave darkness and move into the light and and as they walk through their life further and further away from the darkness, what they do is in verse 23. And to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now that's a lowercase s. This is your spirit, your essence. You know, your mind is your thinking capacity. A lot of that has to do with nature. It's the way that God designed our bodies to include this brain of ours. Within that area, we make a lot of soulish decisions, soul decisions. We're thinking through something, and and with our limited understanding of the universe, our limited understanding of the spiritual things, we make choices, and many times we're wrong. But then we have the essence of who we are, and that's our spirit. And so by renewing the essence of who you are, the essence of of who you are, your soul, your mind comes along with it. And so be renewed in your spirit. Don't follow the old, uninformed, or ignorant knowledge and understanding you had, but put on a new, renewed truth that you have found in the light. And the third thing that is done is found in verse 24, it says, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is moving toward the fullness of the stature of Christ to become a mature Christian. Righteousness. So first of all, the likeness of God, moving toward that is righteousness. Being what you ought to be is righteousness. And so when you first give your life to Christ, righteousness is not the same as somebody who has been walking and following Jesus Christ for 20, 30 years. That person who has been walking with him for a long time ought to be something more than what they were when they first came to Christ. Unfortunately, what we find within the modern American church are people who come to Christ and begin the journey. They, have a, they become new creatures who are now given the ability to continue the journey, but they have chosen to sit down and not move, to be satisfied with just beginning the journey. This is something that has stymied the work of God in America. This is something that has that has hindered the transformation of your family. This has hindered the future of our children. This has hindered the future of God's work in America because too many American Christians have received a new birth and become satisfied and refuse to grow more into the likeness of Christ, to become righteous, what they ought to be. And so, therefore, everything stops there. Holiness is, in other words, otherness, to be other than. So when a Christian becomes righteous, they become what they ought to be, and therefore they are no longer like the rest of the world that has not received Christ. They are other than. They are what they ought to be in Christ Jesus. They have begun to become more like them. They were becoming more like him. And so they are becoming righteous. Each step of the way, they are more of what they ought to be. And therefore, they become someone who is not like the rest of the world that has not begun that journey. They are other than the unsaved. They are other than those who have not been transformed or given a new birth in Christ Jesus. So therefore, put on your new self 
and be what you ought to be and be other than what you used to be. Don't become haughty. Don't become prideful because then that's just the fruit of somebody who hasn't changed. But become somebody who is humble and grateful, singing hymns, singing spiritual songs, singing, uh, singing praise songs, spiritual songs, that just spontaneous praise of God. Become someone who is like Christ Jesus. And you will be what you ought to be, and you will be other than the lost world. I want to finish up with a couple of more scriptures from the Apostle John. In John, John chapter 12, 35 and 36, it says this. So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. First of all, this is Jesus talking about himself, their teacher of this is, truth. This is a time for him to share with them all those last lessons tie everything up into a good bow so that they're ready to move on without him. So this is this limited amount of time. But we're also in that place too. We only have a limited amount of time to take advantage of some of our teachers. We have great Sunday school teachers that they're getting up there in years and maybe they'll, they'll one day not be able to teach us. And that gift of God that has been placed in their heart just like it was placed in Ravi Zacharias, who now is getting closer and closer to the end of his life, battling cancer. Now we hope that God heals him, but it could be that his time will be up and the light that he shared, the light that Christ has given him through the word of God and the light that he could so eloquently defend and teach, that particular light may go out. Learn now from those teachers. Learn now from those pastors. Your pastor may not be here forever. Your pastor may retire. Your pastor may start hanging out with his grandkids one day. So take advantage of this time. I have a particular calling. I have a particular talent to share a particular part of the Gospels, to emphasize a particular part of walking with God. That time will be over one day. And then somebody else will replace me. And, and I trust that God will send somebody that has their particular emphasis. And so the light that I bring, that I receive from the Word of God and receive from the Holy Spirit, that light will be over with and you'll need to learn from someone else. So take advantage of this time that you have that teacher, that you have that pastor. Take advantage of this time that the Word of God can be freely owned and freely read and, and freely uh, studied in, in public. Take advantage of that because that may not always be the case. Take advantage of this time that you're in the light because otherwise the darkness will overtake you again. And that's the thing about sitting in one place, the darkness is always chasing you. And it'll catch up. So keep on moving on your journey toward the, the light of the truth of Jesus Christ and becoming more like Him. And the darkness will never overtake you. You'll always outpace it. The next thing is, is to become sons of light. Become the offspring of truth. Far too often when I hear Christians talk about what they believe is truth, it's often revealed whose sons they really are. And they're not the sons of light. They're the sons of fear, sons of hatred, the sons of judgment. But sometimes... We have great joy when we discover Christians that are truly sons of light, the offspring of the light of Jesus Christ. Don't you just rejoice when you come across those people? Don't you just thank God that those people are in your church? Don't you thank God that somebody in your family is, is a, a, an offspring of the light? That's what all of us should become. 
it should be known by those who know us that we are the offspring of truth, that we are sons and daughters of the light. Finally, in John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 7, it says this, This is the message we have heard from Him, Jesus Christ, and proclaim to you that God is light, in other words, truth, and in Him is no darkness at all, in other words, falsehoods. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness or walk within the lies we tell ourselves, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. When we walked in the darkness and when we, we stumble and fall, we cover ourselves in sin. But it is Christ Jesus that cleanses us, washes away all that sin, and makes us whole, helps us get back on the journey, into the journey, help us, helps us to become someone walking in the light, moving toward the light. We become sons of light because he has washed the darkness of sin away. One thing I want you to remember, when you're interacting with people who are not believers in Christ Jesus, when you're interacting with people who are immature in their Christianity despite going to church for decades, when you encounter those people, do not judge them. Take care of your own imperfections before you judge them for theirs. In fact, the scriptures tell us not to judge a thing before it's time. When is it time to judge these things? When Christ Jesus is sitting at the white throne judgment and he is judging. That's the only time. And so don't judge people because there's darkness in them or they are stumbling around with a lack of understanding because the truth is not in it. Don't judge them. It's not to be judged. It is a state of being to be rescued from. So love them. Be concerned about them. Pray for them. Be a guiding light that can bring them toward truth. And I know that you're going to be filled with great joy when you see that happen. So, in our lives, we are to be a light that is not hidden under a bushel. We're to be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We're supposed to be people who are righteous and holy. Mm -hmm.